I'm escaping to the one place that hasn't been corrupted by capitalism. The Wrestling Life. Hey everybody, it's The Wrestling Life. It's episode 319. It's the annual Thanksgiving Spectacular. I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. Liam! We have so much to be thankful for this year. (laughs) And so many things that we are not (laughs) thankful for. (laughs) Uh, I guess. Yes. I like that. (laughs) we're, We're keeping things fresh after 319 episodes of being the only the first and the only wrestling podcast and this is i believe our ninth thanksgiving spectacular that sounds plausible sure (laughs) ridiculous well it's evergreen content time everyone because we are recording this ahead of time so that we don't have to do a show on thanksgiving Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah so for our evergreen um, Thanksgiving spectacular of this year, uh, Liam has um, given us a topic, and I love it. And would you like to explain, Liam? That's right. So uh, it's always a hot topic every year. Uh, the Of course, the you, you work for the Wrestling Observer website, WrestlingObserver.com. And uh, and of course, big part of that big draw every year is, of course, the Observer Awards, right? Everybody gets big mad because nobody from WWE ever wins Wrestler of the Year and, you know, all the stuff. It creates a lot of a lot of capital D discourse on 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 the Twitters and the Reddits and and what have you. So uh, and my favorite category uh, since I've been aware of the Observer is is of course the most disgusting promotional tactic award uh which mm-hmm. goes all the way back to the the observers first starting in 1981 and is still going strong in 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 present day so i thought what could be fun is for us to look at what won in that category every year um and also a lot of dave's awards in that award issue are named after a wrestler right there's the the Ric Flair Luthez Award for the best wrestler. There's the Brian Danielson Technical Wrestler Award. So I think at the end of this, we need to pick out the the wrestler or promoter or what have you that this award category should be named after. I think far and away, there's one clear choice. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. we will get we will get there. That's right. So we're <laughs> And the best part of this award, as we'll get into, is it varies in what is considered a what is a promotional tactic, and b what exactly is considered disgusting about it. Uh, it, it can often be left up to interpretation. So, without sure. without any further ado, it's going to be one of those classic Liam reads a list and Ethan goes, mm, "Yes, <laughs> mm, episodes. Yes, <laughs> we love those. We love those here, don't we, folks?" Mm. <laughs> mm. So kicking it off hot in 1981, uh, thanks to Alan Cheapshot, A-L-L-A-N underscore Cheapshot on Twitter. You probably already follow him if you listen to this show, but he has a wonderful thread that uh, that kind of ripened this idea in my head and uh, got me thinking about it. So kicking off in 1981, we have uh, yeah, LaBelle Promotions introducing a monster character. Uh, as the promotion was on its last legs, the idea was to push a real monster which had been constructed in a lab. And all I'm all I'm thinking, watch uh, reading that, is that he was just like 25 years too early or 30 years too early because that's Lucha Underground, right? Very much so. Yes, yes. This is the first uh, actual footage I've ever seen of the monster. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know where Alan got the gif, but it's it's fascinating. It's like a guy in a bad Frankenstein outfit just <laughs> just having a wrestling match. Yeah, the shoes are are, are really quite something. <laughs> he does have like the thick platforms. It's it's pretty amazing. 
and uh yeah so i like i don't know is that that's not disgusting to me it's it's pretty incredible actually but you know if you were a fan of that t- promotion at the time maybe it was a uh, particularly abhorrent to you i don't know well you can f- you can follow the trajectory of this award as you mentioned in the uh in the setup here and early on it was just like what was goofy or insulting to fans and then <laughs> And then after like the first five years, it it takes a, a sharp turn and mm-hmm. like co- companies really start doing really disgusting things. And then like the the first four or five years of the award are one thing. And then the next. Uh, actually, it's like the first two years <laughs> and then the next the next 38 years of the award are actually really disgusting. Agreed. So for maybe our last mild <laughs> entry on this <laughs> list, 1982, the winner was Bob Backlund still being the WWF champion. <laughs> uh, he won the title in 78, had been champion ever since. He kind of, I guess, I guess he kind of has the rep because Bruno was such a, you know, a firebrand for, for the WWF. Bob was kind of the boring guy in between. Uh, you know, the end of the Bruno era and the start of the Hogan era. So he's just this weird stopgap meets. It's weird to call him a stopgap guy because he was champion for five years. But I feel like that's kind of how history looks at him now. If you're at least the WWE version of history. Yeah. I mean, Bob Drew. Mm-hmm. He he wasn't Bruno. He wasn't Hogan, as you mentioned. He wasn't even Superstar Graham, but he drew. I, you know, Bob was, I guess you had to be there. It's like Bob Backlund has never been my cup of tea and has always been felt like something from several generations ago, even mm-hmm. when it was he was just one generation removed. Yes, <laughs> he he felt older than that for some reason. But like, I guess you had to be there because like there have been more insulting things than a good technical wrestler who can't cut very good, very good promos. Um being, being world champion i don't know agreed and speaking of worse <laughs> we're <laughs> we're moving right along to 1983 here where uh they 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 decided to do a uh a a real life neck injury to for to further a f- or they used a real life neck injury to kind of further a feud between uh, two wrestlers they sort of reference eddie gilbert's real life broken neck uh, and they sort of try to re redo that with uh, with the masked superstar and uh, and the aforementioned Bob Backlund. So that we're already getting into the territory of guys getting terribly injured and the promoter immediately going, maybe we can make it the gimmick of the guy who hurt him <laughs> that he hurts people now. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. My only take on this is. Uh, um billy as uh mass superstar um he was one of those guys like arn anderson who ha- looked 57 years old <laughs> from the time he was 28 and uh now that he's you know 75 years old he only really looks like 60 or 62 mm-hmm. but uh one of those guys born old yes billy D as <laughs> demolition demolition acts yeah i mean he and uh he and smash are still doing like cons and and appearances in the paint and you're like maybe without the paint you would look like a thousand but with the paint on yeah he still still he he still looks like gax you know you can tell who it is smash on the other hand (laughs) mm. he has hit the wall the years have not been as kind to, no. to the repo man uh but moving on to 1984 <laughs> year uh now we're getting into it baby uh 1984 blackjack mulligan fakes a heart attack in cwf mid-atlantic uh <laughs> they they build up to it by the way they don't just he doesn't just have a heart attack on the show they introduce a uh, that he has a a heart issue and then after a little while they build to the heart attack <laughs> What a, what a business! <laughs> I, for one, am shocked that Blackjack Mulligan would counterfeit anything. <laughs> Blackjack, 
Blackjack, of course, did prison time for counterfeiting U.S. currency. <laughs> <laughs> Frankly, faking a heart attack a little underwhelming compared to <laughs> printing <laughs> fake money. It's pretty incredible. <laughs> On the list of the crimes that wrestlers usually get arrested to, printing fake money, he, he might be a unicorn in that case. Indeed. Fake heart attacks, a theme. <laughs> <laughs> a and theme he- on this list. Yes, and speaking of that, I think this is where we're going to hit a stretch here for the next few years where we see one of the first contenders of who we could name this award after. Yep. And that and that is, of course, the wonderful world of world-class championship wrestling. Fritz von Erich's territory down in down in uh down in Texas. Starting off with uh the usage of Fritz's son, Mike von Erich's real life near-death experience. He had contracted toxic shock syndrome and uh had like a, a actual real brain damage. And after a very short time, they brought out a, I assume it was a worked doctor, although that's not confirmed in Alan's, in Alan's thread to announce that he was, that Mike was, uh, it had been a miracle and Mike had suddenly recovered and, uh, and they, they, he was back in the ring very, very quickly after almost dying and having actual real brain damage. Man, the whole I know we're getting a movie here soon. Mm-hmm. So I'm curious to see that. But uh, both um, world-class documentaries, there's like an indie one and the WWF one, WWE one. Mm-hmm. Both both are incredible and both go into this uh, time period. And uh, yeah, Mike, Mike Van Eric's guy shouldn't have been in the ring anyway, but because of his last name, he was. And uh, yeesh. Yeah, it's it's yeah, that this is again where you start to actually maybe get a sense of what this category is actually should be (laughs) should be dedicated to. And uh, and Fritz came back strong the next year looking to repeat. And uh, he did by uh, (laughs) exploiting the death, the real death of Gino Hernandez. And in fact, within the context of the world class television show, he had the announcers equating the real death of a man with the uh, the storyline blinding of uh, gentleman Chris Adams, as if these were both equal tragedies that uh, that the the world class fans had faced lately. And again, gosh, now we're (laughs) what a business. This is just this is this is really where Fritz is is really shining. Yeah, I think I think far and away this should be the Fritz von Eric Award. I know I'm I'm cutting to the chase here. We're um, but yeah, this is yeah, yeah. As we'll get to, he is not he does not have the most quantitative wins in this category. But if we're talking the quality of a disgusting promotional tactic, uh, as as we continue on to 1987 here, uh, yeah, oh, before we do that, can yeah, I just hop in with yes. One of the fascinating urban legends in wrestling is that Houston promoter Paul Bosch had secretly fathered Gino Hernandez. Really? Yes. I did not know that story. Yes. Um, And uh, Dave Meltzer tells a story of being in uh, Paul Bosch's office in Houston. And he's like, man, he's got a uh, he's got a portrait of um, of Gino Hernandez on his wall. And uh, he goes, why do you have a uh, why do you have a portrait of Gino Hernandez on 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 the wall? And uh, Paul, by oh that was me that was me when I was a kid. And it's holy yes, Ooh. these guys these guys look exactly alike. And so the urban legend goes that Paul Bosch like uh, had a child out of wedlock and uh, may have already had a family or something at the time. And so he financially supported Gino's mom and always looked out for Gino and get, found a spot for Gino in wrestling. And uh, anyway, it's one of those urban legends that no one will ever really say the quiet part out loud. But mm-hmm. Gino Hernandez being Paul Bosch's son is uh, is one of my favorite urban legends in wrestling. That's pretty incredible. I, yeah, I was <laughs> I was not aware of that story, but that's 
gosh, Texas, man. The Texas wrestling yep. scene. What a <laughs> Yep. What a what a what a what a ish show. But uh yep. yeah. <laughs> and speaking of which, as we move into 1987 here, we have the exploitation of the death of the aforementioned Mike Von Erich. Uh, World Clash had changed their David Von Erich tribute show, which was sort of an annual thing to David, who had died in 84, and uh, to a David and Mike memorial show. Uh, They charged extra for VIP tickets and had mud wrestling matches on the show. So if you weren't aware of how desperate Vince McMahon had made promoters like Fritz by 1987, uh, exploiting two of your son's deaths, uh, at the same time and also offering up, you know, the kind of sleaze stuff like that, which I mean, that's like small potatoes compared to the death exploitation and trying to gouge on ticket prices because it's a, you know, a special show for, you know, for the death of your two sons is uh boy Fritz. He's <laughs> the, the, the space between him and anyone else who could win this award is really, I think it's just it's getting it's getting larger by the moment we speak here. We we do have a, a couple of year stretch here coming up that's that's mm, as far as <laughs> oof might even be better <laughs> or worse whichever but <laughs> yeah I I don't necessarily think I'm nitpicking and going well actually and none <laughs> of this matters but I mean it's podcast who cares uh I don't think Fritz. Fritz's territory was going down anyway, and I don't think it had anything to do with Vince, because, like, Texas is one of the last places Vince broke. Mm-hmm. And, like, even they didn't draw in Texas. Like, I mean, they drew relatively well, but, like, as far as, like, being the, the only show in town, it wasn't until, like, Austin that they ever drew in Texas. Fair. So I think it was just Fritz's territory was going down because people were dropping like flies <laughs> and, and i mean how many different ways can you do the free birds and the von erics you know like anyway anywho yeah you have you have the one hot angle and it goes for a, a length of time but as we see all across wrestling history at some point you gotta give people it could be hot for years but eventually you're gonna hit that point of no return where fans are tired of it and by the time you realize they're tired of it it's too late (laughs) right right or he's you know i don't want to compare fritz and eric bischoff although there might be anyway um (laughs) both promoters seem to have had one good idea Mm -hmm. (laughs) and just kept trying to hit it again and again and again Mm mm-hmm yeah there's uh the the parallels end in 1988 however (laughs) As Eric never uh, booked himself in an angle where he had a fake heart attack, surprisingly enough. Uh, but yeah, Fritz goes on television doing a uh, doing a heart attack angle to get uh, get a sympathy. This is obviously like barely barely a year after after his his second son had died, and uh, yeah, it was it was considered I, I guess poor taste to say the least to have again a a fake death angle mixed in with all of the real life death angles or death not angles uh the real life deaths that were were happening all around this territory to do a a fritz heart attack angle to try to sell tickets is questionable yes <laughs> so that agreed that, that, that yeah I'm, I'm not afraid to say it doing fake heart attacks <laughs> after your real sons have been dead bad idea uh, but that that does end uh, Fritz's reign of terror here, as in uh, 1989. Uh, by the way, Fritz Fritz having a fake heart attack one in '88, and then in '89, we have, uh, uh, of course, also happened in '88, uh, the death of Bruiser Brody, where he was stabbed to death in the shadow in the showers in uh, in Puerto Rico by Jose Gonzalez, and uh, after the the case was closed very abruptly. Not only was Jose brought back into WWC, uh, he was he was in fact uh, pushed as a top babyface. Uh, what a business, Carlos Colon, my man. That's I don't think he has he doesn't have enough entries on this list, but 
I mean, this is a, this is a pretty high, high one on the list. Indeed. Yes. A murderer being pushed as a baby face. Yes. Yep. And yeah. And not for the last time, Jose making a little bit of a case for himself here. Uh, yeah. And uh, I guess I guess technically he wasn't involved in this FMW angle from 1990, as uh, obviously Brody was a huge star in Japan. Onita wanted to capitalize it, so he brought in he brought in Jose Gonzalez, and he basically did an angle and attempted to to blade his own stomach to make it in, to imply that Jose Gonzalez, after this press conference, had stabbed him. And when he couldn't quite get blood out of his stomach, he decided to blade his forehead and then rub it on his on his shirt. So there's pictures of this in this uh, this Alan Cheap Shot thread. Just just he's covered. He covered himself in blood to do a fake stabbing angle. It's uh, and, you know, (laughs) I get it's not as bad as being an actual murderer, but (laughs) it's not great either. Onita, everyone, still at it 30, 30, 32 years later. That's right. He's like a, you know, he he's he's lasted long enough and people have forgotten about things like this enough that he gets to be, you know, it's not quite a Noki level, but he gets to be like just like this legendary figure now. Like nobody has to think about all the weird, weird, terrible stuff he did. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And uh, 91. And here we see probably uh, the start of what will be the last serious candidate for this award in Vincent man's world wrestling federation. We of course get the Sergeant slaughter Gulf war, Iraqi sympathizer angle, which I think looking back on it now, it's pretty, it's pretty funny, but I don't know, maybe it's not right to have a person on your fake cartoon wrestling show talking, you know, pledging allegiance to Saddam Hussein and, (laughs) and uh, you know, saying he wants to kill America. Like I'm, I'm not one for blind patriotism and, and there's, we're not going to get into a discussion on the Gulf war here, but like, I feel, like, yeah, what? at the time they were trying to, you know, they were trying to do what the WWF, I mean, WWF was built off of the, the, the American hero, right. Of Hulk Hogan and the American hero in the eighties. And what better way to, for the American hero to have a villain to conquer than for a guy who was going to be, allegedly supported by public you know u.s public enemy number one in the you know in iraq and and saddam hussein i don't uh going back and reading the observers from this time period it's like it it was clearly very distasteful at the time Mm -hmm. it seems kind of tame quite frankly to me 30 years later but yeah, it, de- it 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 depends how you look at it, I guess. Because it, yes, you you use real life tragedy to try to draw money. It would be like uh, using nine eleven in an mm. angle, which which, <laughs> yeah, which oh yeah, they they, they did, <laughs> they did. Um, yeah, I I don't I I I don't I don't have strong. I guess I should have strong feelings about this, but I don't. Yeah, again, maybe it's also because of that, because on the list of things you could <laughs> you could pin Vince McMahon to the wall over. This is like, yeah, this is even just if you kept it to things he booked and allowed on his television. This is, yeah. Uh, I don't, yeah, like I said, it's and I think it's one of those things where you can at least follow the train of thought because there's a lot of these where you can't. But this one, right. you're like, OK, Hulkster's the big time babyface American hero who's the ultimate villain he could fight in 1991 america a guy from iraq <laughs> we don't have yes. one all right sergeant slaughter is gonna devote himself to iraq and that's that's the match all right you can at least follow yes. the logic there right <laughs> something i can't quite follow the logic on just kidding it's very obvious it's it's a it's a 1992 special it's the promoter pushing his son right it's it's eric watts getting a push on wcw television despite not being very good Bill Watts had just come on as president of WCW. There's a million, you know, just go watch any like Ric Flair DVD. Anyone that has any, nobody really has anything good to say about Bill Watts this time in 1992 as the EVP of WCW. But so I don't know. I don't even know if like 
you could say Eric Watts being on television is the worst thing <laughs> about Bill Watts's WCW, but you know, it's not great. <laughs> Yeah, it's one of those things though where this award again it goes back and forth between being a serious, um actually disgusting promotional thing and just like something much uh much tamer. And this is very tame. <laughs> yes. We had a strict yeah, we had a, a stretch of tame WCW angles. Uh yes. go, going forward here in ninety three, we have the Cactus Jack amnesia angle. Which, I don't know, I think this one's pretty funny. Like, it's terrible, like, it's bad, and if you could say it's a bad promotional tactic, because it didn't it didn't lead to anyone wanting to see a wrestling match. <laughs> but right. I don't, I wouldn't call it disgusting as, uh, yes, they had a, they had a bit where, they had like a, a fake reporter lady following following the amnesiac Cactus Jack around, and then I know Foley tells a story, he like tried to save it at the last minute and say that he was just playing mind games with Vader or whatever, but it was, it's, it was pretty, it's, it's dumb, but again, it's what have, we've just been talking about fake heart attacks and real deaths and everything. So it's hard to, uh, to imagine that this was, this, this belongs on the list. Agree. I have, I have no, I have, uh, I have no strong feelings about this. <laughs> and uh, this is, this is like, I'm pretty well versed, I think, in like Hogan, post Hogan WCW. But this time period where this, uh, where the 1994 entry comes is like a blind spot for me. So they book up, they do Hogan and Flair like all summer. And finally they go to a, a retirement stipulation and Flair loses. And so the 1994 winner for most discussion, <laughs> disgusting promotional tactic is Ric Flair being forced into a retirement angle. And, uh, you know, the highlights of it were were Rick begging Hogan and Savage to say the right things to the right people to get him reinstated. And then he's like Vader's manager for a little bit. And then he just one day he's just back, I think, because Vader didn't want to do a job to Hogan or something. That's kind of the genesis of it. Uh, So the program was supposed to be it was supposed to be a three match program between Hogan and Flair that summer right so they did mm-hmm. one they did the first one at the bash of the beach they did one at the clash of the champions and then they did the third in a cage at halloween havoc and hogan was supposed to drop the uh second match to flair and then win the third one mm-hmm. he, so hogan, hogan was obviously always going to win the program so hogan decides you know the second program of the second match in the program on the clash I think Hogan did. They did like a Tanya Harding angle mm-hmm. where uh, where the brother Brudai uh, attacked <laughs> H- attacked Hogan. Um, but regardless, Hogan decided that he was not going to lose the title to Flair in the second match of the program. Doesn't didn't work for him, brother. <laughs> so the the third match of the program, they they're like, well, we need a hook now because we've already done Hogan and Flair just straight up twice. And uh, so they came up with the retirement angle and they told Flair, like, look, you're retiring and you will work in the office the year while you're off. And uh, you need to be away for you need to be away for one year to sell this. But you will uh, we will bring you back after one year. And I think he got a financial, he got like a bonus to do the angle too. He got like a hundred grand or something. Uh, but Flair wasn't happy about it. But uh, Ric Flair has uh, never been accused of being a great businessman. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and he got himself, he got outworked by Hulk Hogan. So, yeah. And then he did come back and he would like do jobs for Vader uh, in matches where Hogan was wrestling Vader, which didn't make any sense. Like <laughs> Fla- Flair lost a strap match that was Hogan versus Vader at like uncensored 95. <laughs> and it's like Flair was like in drag and 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 uh, and somehow ended up tied to the strap with Hogan and Hogan touched all four corners and, and won a strap match and Vader didn't. I think Vader eventually did do one job for Hogan, but yeah, Vader was like, nah. Vader was kind of the last of guys who would not do a job for if he didn't want to do a job. I was wondering, yeah, I was wondering if there was like 
I mean, they weren't in Japan at the same time. I was trying to figure like why Hogan was his his breaking point, or maybe he just he saw the writing on the wall. And unlike when he worked with Sting or Flair, he knew he was never getting the win back. So maybe that was the his his way yes. of the of just going uh uh-uh. uh he, he he took I the believe pipe, so took the Piper route and just said not doing it not doing it unless he unless he jobs first. <laughs> Yeah, that's my that's my understanding of kind of the Vader situation. And it's like Vader Vader was already kind of past his peak at that point, but mm-hmm. he was like, "Oh, look, I got to protect myself in Japan. I've never been to the WWF at that point. There's like I need to protect myself and I I'm not I ain't doing no jobs." <laughs> hey, you know. <laughs> it's again, something that seems kind of passé now, I think, but yeah. It kind of in that era <laughs> When Hulk Hogan was going to be on top in that company, no matter what, like because of the amount of money they were paying him, it's like, yeah, you you get your one or two matches with him and then you're done. Like you're done. You're done working on top. So, well, and it was Hogan. It was, Hogan was just using the formula that Vince used, which is, OK, give me some big stinky giants to slay <laughs> and we'll go around the horn once or twice with them and then plug in another big stinky monster. And Vader mm-hmm. was like. I'm not just your average big stinky monster. You're not going to do that to me. Right. And uh, from there, we move on to 1995. Oh, oh, Gene. Uh, I, I'm not going to look to slander Gene Okerlund because if he wasn't doing this 900 line gimmick, 900 lines were a big thing in the 90s, folks. And <laughs> Gene, the, 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 the entry that won Gene's 900 hotline, the 1995 uh, most disgusting promotional tactic was uh, he asked fans to call in to find out which former 45 year old heavyweight champion had died. And uh, of course, implying that Ric Flair was dead. And uh, as it turned out, it was a former AWA tag team champion named Jerry Blackwell. And uh, I guess the word was, I guess there's some, there's some data in the observer. They made a lot of money off of it that weekend, which I mean, that's the whole point. That was the whole point of those, those 900 lines. But yeah, that's, Again, if Gene wasn't there doing it, somebody else would have been. It would have been the Mike Tenay hotline or whatever. So it's like, I don't, I don't blame Gene for this, but yeah, it's, it's, it's gross. It's, it's, it's grody for, for sure. Particularly when you look at the breakdown of that data, it's like, what did they get from? They get, they made like between forty five and seventy thousand dollars. Yes. <laughs> for this and it's like is it completely worth selling out your credibility and uh for 45 to seventy thousand dollars and apparently the answer is yes <laughs> but uh gene's one of those guys who's universally loved and it's hard to say anything bad about him but uh um i don't think the 900 lines shilling for the 900 lines were uh, a, a career highlight for sure yeah that was a yeah, like I said, that that was the that was the thing. Exploit people or a lot of times it was, you know, Hogan had a hotline when he was still in WWF and it was all about, yeah, just getting and hopefully getting while they always had the, you know, get your parents permission. It was mostly about let's trick kids into calling in and <laughs> yes, and staying on the line <laughs> for 45 minutes. And then right. after, because after the first minute, it goes up to eight dollars a minute or whatever. Right. So yeah, it's part of a like I said, if it wasn't Gene doing it, I'm not I'm not saying his hands are completely clean because he still went along with it, but yeah, if it wasn't Gene doing it, somebody else would have been working the the 900 hotline there. And yep. <laughs> boy, what a next couple of years we have here. 96, Ugh. it's fake Diesel and fake Razor Ramon, which was part of the ill-fated Jim Ross returns to the company as like a a heel manager, but he's also still doing some commentary at this point, I think. Sure. <laughs> dumb. Just it's dumb. It's a, it, again, a bad promotional tactic because no one wants to boo Jim Ross and nobody cares about two guys dressed up as diesel, but you know, they were, uh, you know, they were mad. They were big mad because, because Scott and Kevin left and they were getting, they were getting their butts kicked. So, Whatever. <laughs> 26 years later, I do want to boo Jim Ross. <laughs> As I now, I'm like, I'm all I'm all for Jim Ross becoming a 
if he could bump, I'd say make him a heel manager on TV now. But, uh, but Who's yeah, to say he can't. <laughs> we, we won't know unless unless we try. All right. Just, unless we try to bump him. <laughs> although Jay White tried to bump him a few years ago and that didn't that didn't go well. For Ugh. Him. Yeah, he still hates Jay White for that. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, <laughs> anywho. Uh, hey, if you're going to make an omelet, you got to break a few eggs, right? Like I paid a lot more attention to Jay White after he did that, and he and Barnett tried to <laughs> tried to shoot fight him. Like yes, so it was a it was a little bit of a career maker for Jay anyway. But uh, speaking of Jay, best wishes to Jay Leno, uh, who uh, who suffered some burns, the, some gas burns this week. Yeah, hey, maybe I thought you were going to get some gasoline burns. <laughs> It was a gasoline fire. I, it was an oil fire. I got gasoline burns on my face, third degree. Oh man! Like I had to make sure he wasn't going to be like seriously injured or dead first. But yeah, as... I look like Two Face now. <laughs> but as soon as I saw him, he was like already given quotes to the press. I was like, "Great, we could just do shtick about this now." <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> on a more serious yeah. note. Eh, hey, maybe bring me some Neosporin. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I asked you this off the air, but do you think he, when, when the fire was going on, do you think he tried to put it out by doing that little head bump? <laughs> hey, Kev, did you hear the, hey, um, did you hear about this? I, uh, I received third degree burns in a gasoline fire. Oh, oh, oh Jay. Oh. This is it. This is what you come to the Thanksgiving Spectacular for. Me reading lists and, and dueling Jay Leno bits. And uh, coming back down to Earth here in 1997, this is where we hit another stretch of some, some pretty rough ones. Uh, Vince McMahon chose to interview Melanie Pillman the day after Brian Pillman was found dead in his hotel room live on Monday Night Raw. Uh, if you saw the Dark Side of the Ring uh, thing that they did about uh, Pillman last year, you know that Melanie was no saint herself. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty bad. It's pretty bad. It was bad enough that this beat out the screw job this year, right? So it's like, it's, it's pretty awful. Yeah, you got a millionaire. Uh, interviewing someone who's uh, interviewing a widow saying, gee, what are you going to do for money? <laughs> yep. It's like, well, you could uh, you could cut her a check. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, played into this weird uh, thing that I think Vince uh, Vince had a a, a uh, fixation on Melody Pillman. And uh, yeah, so there you go. Yep, and uh, going on to 98, WCW comes roaring back with a a turning Scott Hall's very real, very real alcoholism uh, issues into a angle involving him, you know, vomiting on Eric Bischoff on live TV. And uh, they they kind of try to turn it into an, an, a feud with him and Nash. And it's just... It's bad. It's it's bad television. This is where this is one of those things where there's a lot of funny stuff in those last couple of years of WCW. This stuff, if you watch it back, is is pretty uncomfortable. Yeah, and they tried to like nobody believed that Hall and Nash hated each other, and they tried to turn it. You know, they somehow were trying to use this to. Ugh. It, it they were just trying everything to get Hall versus Nash to work, and it's like nobody believed hall versus nash so mm -hmm. this didn't not only did it not work it, it was it distasteful it also didn't work so like what what are we doing here yep that's uh that's that's a a hallmark of i think a lot of these entries it's not only like you sold <laughs> you sold your soul and you got nothing back from it right um but uh moving on to 99 it's the death of owen hart and more specifically the WWF deciding to continue the show after after Owen was dead again if you've seen the dark side of the ring and you hear the stories of people that worked that show bumping in that ring where there was a dent where Owen had fell yeah this is uh 
this is this is maybe if there was a single entry that was going to sew it up for somebody, this would probably be the one for Vince. Yep. Can't add anything else other than uh, they should they should they should have stopped the show. They should have gone off the air. But, yeah, uh, they didn't. And uh, OK, we get a light. <laughs> we get a one year reprieve to something a little bit lighter and more fun in the year 2000. And it is, of course. David Arquette winning the WCW World Heavyweight Championship on Thunder by pinning Eric Bischoff uh, to win the belt in a tag team match because that's what WCW was in the year 2000. Um, you know, they if I were picking something from WCW 2000, I would probably pick when they had Canyon take a big bump off a stage and in the same building where Owen Hart had died six months earlier. Um, yeah, but you know, David Arquette being the world champion was bad too. But again, when you're, when you're surrounded by all this real life terribleness, it's hard to be like, Oh, the guy from scream winning, winning your fake belt is the, the most disgusting thing. It's like, well, not really. Yeah. Well, this is, uh, one of those weird, one of those weird ones. Yep. Mm -hmm. And (laughs) speaking of a weird one, just. It's just sometimes you get a little in, like insight into the psyche of someone that has just been rich all of their lives and has never really faced any adversity. Um, and we got a glimpse of that in the 2001 winner for this award, which is uh, Stephanie McMahon comparing her father's indictment and steroid trial to the 3000 people that died in the September 11th terrorist attacks, um, which, you know, I, it's it's again something that seems it's so ri- ridiculous like it's like a bit that would be in an arrested development episode or something where <laughs> where the heiress compares her dad's steroid trial to you know one of the greatest tragedies in the history of a nation but you know here we are sheltered spoiled um you know child uh says something clueless on television it's like i i don't blame her as much as i blame whoever allowed this to air <laughs> yeah i was gonna say what uh did stephanie have some em- like political enemies around this time already like i feel like this is before her her real heyday is like the head of creative and stuff <laughs> yeah it's before that i i don't know um I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't hate. I still 20, 20 some years later. I don't hate Stephanie. I don't blame Stephanie for any of this. Don't blame Conan either. <laughs> <laughs> I know a lot of you think. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's like I said, it's it was very it was very stupid. It's been cut out of like every subsequent re-airing of this show. I'm pretty sure. But it did air live on uh, on on UPN back in the day. So, and then we hit again, a, like a golden age of just what we're we're back to just like bad angles for a couple of years here. Uh, starting yeah. in two thousand two with the the world famous uh, Triple H, Katie Vick, Kane uh, necrophilia storyline, which is to date some of the worst television. I think anyone has ever produced. Um, yeah, it, it's 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 bizarre. It's, I mean, it is disgusting, mm-hmm. but not like not disgusting in the way that I think the 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 name of the award uh, implies. Like, I think it's it, it's it's bad and it's gross and it's weird, mm-hmm. but like uh, I. Like, I, it... well, this, well, this kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier. Where like you can't see the through line for why no. you would do this, <laughs> other than no. that Vince was really out of his mind around this time period, more so than he was in other time periods, and was yes. just and was concerned about business going down and feeling like they needed an edge yeah. on the show. So, but again, this is what you picked. <laughs> To get yes. to get people talking, like just just 
just really bizarre. Like, yeah, the only answer is that the old man, <laughs> the old man was crazy for a lot longer than maybe we all realized. But <sighs> see, we hit 2003 here and it's just the McMahons are all over TV. <laughs> yes. Which Again, if you go pick out a Raw or a SmackDown from 2003, you will see a McMahon on that show. So I can't I can't argue with the, the facts of the matter, but I also would have to imagine there was something worse on WWE television in 2003 than, uh, you know, Stephanie being the SmackDown GM and Shane feuding with Kane or whatever. Yeah, I, I did not. Uh, I did not hate Stephanie on television at this time. Mm hmm. Um. Yeah, I don't know. That's 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 a weird one to me, and it, it doesn't. It the doesn't Shane, have... the Shane Kane feud, where like Kane hooked Shane's testicles up to a car battery. Mm -hmm. Strange, strange, strange. They, they do a bit across a couple of months where Eric Bischoff makes out with both Vince's wife <laughs> and his daughter. Yeah. So you know, again, just in case you were. <laughs> under any uh, aspersions as to the type of person that Vince McMahon is. Um, yeah, it's like I said, I'm sure there's a lot of bad television mixed in there because it was 2003, but uh, I don't know. It wouldn't, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be the first thing that came to my mind. But uh, hey, 2004, we get a... <laughs> we get a, a, for a forced wedding of Lita. The fact that Lita will do anything with this company... Like, like I, I wonder about her self-esteem sometimes because the things that this company put her through, uh, they do a storyline where uh, Kane, uh, Kane beats Matt Hardy in a wrestling match. And then Lita is forced to marry Kane and then eventually bear Kane's child. Um, that's pretty bad. You know, implied rape angles is pretty bad. Yes. Yes, it's amazing that Lita answered the phone after this period. From 2004 to 2006, they made her do a lot of horrible things and then basically uh, slut shamed her out of the company. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's really like yeah, the fact that she would come back for anything, let alone like be in their Hall of Fame and and do anything with with Vince McMahon's company is is. She is more forgiving than I would be, <laughs> is yep. all I could say. Yep. And uh, moving on there to 2005, we have, of course, uh, WWE not only doing a an angle, of course, the, the top heel getting the big push that summer was Muhammad Hassan, uh, who doing, doing an evil Muslim gimmick, uh, wrestled Hogan and Sean at that Backlash show. Um and then he gets moved over to SmackDown. They're going to heat him up because he's going to wrestle Batista for the world title. Probably win the title if if the legend is true. Um, but first, he's going to feud with Undertaker. And to get to get him over on Undertaker, they have a bunch of masked men uh, come out. And then he chokes the Undertaker uh, unconscious. And uh, this, this particular angle, uh, you could say it was just broadly distasteful anyway you know, stoking things like Islamophobia and, and, and the fear of terrorist attacks and things like that. But on the day that this aired, not the day it was, it wasn't a live show. It had been taped days earlier, but on the day it aired, there it was the day of a bombing in London and they had the choice to edit it off the show and they chose not to. And then the result of that, as is always the case, Vince, Vince McMahon did not get punished for that decision. Muhammad Hassan got punished for that decision. <laughs> right. Uh, television executives uh, were like, uh, we don't want that guy on TV anymore. Yes. Yeah, so his career got ruined. So that was the end of uh, that was the end of Muhammad Hassan. Yeah, no, it was a uh, it was a uh, pretty. Yeah. Like you feel bad for that guy because he was he was doing what he was told. And and then they chose not to, to pull the angle and it it ruined his life. So uh, from there, we move on to the. <laughs> And this could be covering a lot of ground. WWE exploiting the death of Eddie Guerrero. Um, the click, the clip Alan included specifically is the, of course, the famous Eddie's in Hell promo that Randy Orton cuts. Yes, um, but I could, I think you could also make the case that uh, you know, just 
all this, even the, the, the quote unquote happy tributes of, you know, parading his, his widow on television and having Ray do all of his moves and, and, and go on this like trek to win the world title for Eddie. Like you could probably say even that part of it's at least a little bit disgusting, but at least that was like his real life friends and family. Um, but yes, to to try to get heat on it on the other side with with Orton and whoever bad mouthing him. That's that's just like the cherry on top. Yeah, yeah, and they've they've been exploiting Eddie Guerrero for uh, going on seventeen years now since he passed. So. Yeah, he's like an uh, an eternal specter <laughs> on WWE broadcasting. I mean, yeah, from like Batista stuff, a lot of a lot of Ray feuds, even now with the Dominic stuff, they still reference eddie yep yeah and rhea ripley's got a new shirt that's uh an eddie guerrero design <laughs> it's mm-hmm. like they're still they're still exploiting eddie guerrero 17 years after his death yep and uh and from here this is just this is a fascinating slice of what the year 2007 was <laughs> uh which yes. is tna's first entrance on this list which is uh they in the midst of him being suspended uh, after a an incident in a nightclub, which resulted in somebody being paralyzed, uh, TNA signs Adam Pacman Jones and uh, and makes him a tag team champion on the show, even though he couldn't actually because the NFL threatened to sue, uh, he couldn't actually do anything. <laughs> he couldn't actually wrestle, so he won. He won a tag title spot, not actually being able to wrestle a match. And uh, I also have some pretty distasteful references to uh, the the events of that nightclub uh, shooting, including uh, ones made by Mike Tenay. So, yeah, real, uh, real strong first entry on this list for total nonstop action. Yeah, I don't I don't have a lot to add other than uh, this is vintage of it's Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 gross. And uh <laughs> Not to be outdone, however, the, w- the, the World Wrestling Federation come, comes roaring back in 2018 with uh, with an angle they did in uh, in 2008 to uh, to set up to set up a, a Survivor Series that I guess they felt didn't have enough interest. Uh, they decided to, on their website, imply that Jeff Hardy had overdosed in a hotel, and uh, and they basically said, "Tune into the pay per view to see if he's alive." Yeah, that's a thing that they did. That's a thing that they did. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's like, is that the worst? That's probably not even the worst entry involving Jeff Hardy on this list, <laughs> arguably. But it's pretty rough. Uh, and uh, 2009, this one I remember pretty vividly because I was definitely watching SmackDown like week by week at this point. It's the the speaking of women who should never go back to that company. Uh, Mickey James, um, they just they just made a storyline out of the heels calling her fat every week for months and months and months. And uh, it was bad. It was a bad storyline. And it, it was, in fact, disgusting. They called her a pig. That's right. They called her a pig. Mickey James. <laughs> Look at <laughs> this is what like the thing that. This is so low on the list of things to hate about Vince McMahon, but it's like, it's like, how how can you look at that woman and be like, she's disgusting? Like, I don't. Thirty year old Mickey James. <laughs> what is what is what broke in your brain, you weird old creep? Like, like it just doesn't make any sense to me. But uh, you know, eventually, <laughs> in the in the only way that a rich person gets comeuppance i guess vince eventually got his comeuppance in that he has to go home and just sit around at home now <laughs> well That's... they were speaking of trying to uh there's a pattern here of when a female talent would uh be romantically linked with a main eventer and then their relationship would end and then they would try to shut they would try to shame the woman out of the company like they did with Lita in 2006 when her association with Edge ended Mm -hmm. and they shamed her out of the company. Uh, Mickey James was, I mean, I don't think I'm telling tales out of school 13 years later, but uh, the the scuttlebutt at the time was she was John Cena's girlfriend on the road. 
mm-hmm. and uh, and then they they broke up. And uh, John may or may not have been married at the time, mm-hmm. but uh, regardless, he had a girlfriend on the road, and they broke up. And they're like, "Well, it's going to be awkward, and we're going to definitely stick with the main event guy, and uh, and not the woman, and we'll try to shame her out of the company." And it worked. She was in TNA like a year later. So, you know, there's there's a method to the madness, I guess, in that way. But uh, <laughs> moving on to 2010, here's a fun light one. It's the the now legendary stand up for WWE campaign, which was yes. launched mostly as a <laughs> a propaganda tool to try to uh, combat uh, Linda McMahon's Senate. Uh, opponents from using WWE clips against her. <laughs> yes. And it did create some just wonderful, there's some wonderful uh, videos and stuff on this uh, of Vince just like waxing poetic about uh, about the things you can do to uh, to stand up for WWE and and uh, and and what he, what he his call to action in, in those videos is just wonderful. Like just so unhinged and so tone deaf, but in a way where it, it becomes comedy. Spent a hundred million dollars trying to buy a Senate seat. Eventually, <laughs> it got Linda a a, a a spot in Donald Trump's cabinet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Hope it was worth one hundred million dollars. Well, it's funny because when I was looking into this, I didn't remember she ran for Senate again after this. <laughs> she runs again, I think, in twenty twelve. There were two fifty million dollar campaigns. <laughs> Incredible. She, she lost both. She lost both of them. Perhaps it's because she's the least charismatic person to ever be on someone's television screen in the history of television. <laughs> Maybe that's why. I don't know. But anyway, uh, that that leads us to 2011, and I like this one especially because there's a specific qualifier for it, which is. WWE promoting an anti-bullying campaign despite despite blatant mistreatment of Jim Ross. Can you tell who's friends with who? I was like, so again, it's... we've just gotten through talking about Mickey James and Lita, the litany of women who were mistreated. Vicky Guerrero probably on television in that same year. Like it was constant fat jokes and and jokes about how she's ugly and old and whatever. But JR, poor JR is the one that gets gets the nod in our in our little uh, award our little award section here. They mistreated Ric Flair in 1994 by paying him $100,000 to take a year <laughs> off. <laughs> they were they were mean to JR. <laughs> Which again, we've talked about that before. You could we could do a 10 part podcast series just examining the relationship of Vince McMahon and, and Jim Ross. It's weird. It's weird that, yeah. that he took such delight in humiliating that guy on TV and that and, and that that guy yes. kept coming back on TV knowing he was going to get humiliated. Like, yes, there's a lot of, you know, someone could psychoanalyze about that relationship. But yes, I just I howled when i when i saw that and i went and looked in the actual observer to just make sure that yes it specifically says promoting an anti-bullying campaign display despite mistreatment of jr love it yes. love it love it love it and in uh, 2012 we get a, a a new contender on the list although it's i mean it's still vince's company but uh cm punk is 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 hot on the trail the next couple of years along with paul Heyman. as in 2012 the winner is a. Uh, just after Jerry Lawler, literally the night Jerry Lawler came back after nearly dying on the air in uh, in that famous Montreal show. Uh, the night he comes back, he gets like this big emotional entrance where he and JR and Cole hug and and they're back at the commentary booth and they immediately bring CM Punk out and and Paul Heyman pretends to have a heart attack. And that that one it's you know it's again it's it's an angle based off a real life tragedy but also and i could see why in 2012 this felt particularly heinous but when you're reading them all together this is like still pretty low on the list i feel like it's an it's another fake heart attack <laughs> and uh and it was we've seen our up. share <laughs> yes a fake heart attack in wrestling and uh they were very 
I don't know. Like this is played for uh it was played for 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 it's hard to say it was played for laughs when but um I don't think at any point anyone thought that Paul Heyman was having a heart attack. Correct. And uh and if your Lawler's mindset is look, uh, we use any and everything to draw money. So mm-hmm. I I don't think I don't think Lawler cared. It's it's um, like when uh it's like when Jay Leno called Jimmy Kimmel after uh after uh Jimmy dressed up like Jay and did a whole show dressed as Jay. <laughs> He's like, yes. yeah, as long, as long as it's funny, you know, as long as it's funny, <laughs> you know. And Jerry and Jerry's gonna be like, yeah, as long as it draws money, right? So, right. as long as it's an angle, like uh, you know, we everything's an angle. Yes. Yeah, and then uh, speaking of everything being an angle, like mere weeks after uh, Paul Bearer, Bill Moody, had died, uh, CM Punk, of course, was feuding with The Undertaker, and uh, they decided to make that part of the storyline, culminating in the go-home show, which we were in attendance for in Washington, D.C. That show ends with uh, CM Punk laying out The Undertaker and then pouring what was intimated to be Paul Bearer's ashes all over The Undertaker. Uh, you know, yeah. there there was like some scuttlebutt at the time where they said they got the family's permission or whatever. But also, like, maybe they said, hey, we're going to mention your father as part of this feud. Did they say we're going to have CM Punk pour ashes on The Undertaker and tell him right. it's, and pretend it's your dead dad? I don't know. I, I Again, this is tame compared to the Fritz, the Fritz run. But it's right. it's. It's yeah, it's scummy. It's 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 disgusting. In fact, it's not good. I'm not in favor of this. <laughs> Bold. But uh, here in 2014, we move on to another just wonderful addition to this list, which was uh, insulting the fans, the true fans uh, for for daring to spend full pay-per-view price uh, on 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 the WWE product while uh while the network was uh, available for 9.99 which i mean they were really heavy-handed about that <laughs> when yeah. the network launched about you'd have to be an idiot to spend they literally had like michael cole holding up a little cue card of like pay-per-view equal 49.99 yes wwe network equal 9.99 so it's like it was very clear that vince mcmahon thought nothing of his own like really thought it was it was definitely one of those this is what we think of you eras of wwe television but you know i i looked at that more in like a more comedic a more comedic run than uh, or as a comedic entry on this list than anything really serious to get mad about well it's just another fundamental misunderstanding by rich people of how the country works it's like there's a lot of places still even today in rural rural america where high-speed internet is just not a thing mm-hmm. <laughs> and so you have to buy the pay-per-views on cable or satellite and uh and that's what was going on it's like it's not like people weren't dumb there's just some people that couldn't couldn't buy the network right anyway, it doesn't matter now yes Boy, just whiplash here as we go to 2015. Uh, you know, she's in the news. Of course, she just had her, her her first match back a few days ago. And congratulations to the winner of that match. Uh, but yes, Soraya or Paige, as she was known at the time, part of an angle with Charlotte, uh, where they uh, invoked the name of Charlotte's dead brother, Reed, um, in a really weird way where they they like threw it in but they clearly they didn't want to like draw too much attention to it it's like they wanted the 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 oohs and the ahs but they also knew they were going to get roasted for it so they tried to just like throw it in at the end of a segment on a raw and then uh and then uh you know and then of course they they trotted <laughs> they trotted a a very clearly written by Vince McMahon statement about notwithstanding the talent, uh, you know, we wouldn't do things on television if the talent wasn't uh, wasn't OK with it. Basically saying that Char- Charlotte said it was OK. Again, Charlotte being very young in her career and imagine telling Vince McMahon, no, if you want to work in WWE for the rest of your life in, in 2015, when you're a year, or you're like less than a year on the main roster at this point. 
Yeah, it wasn't like a money feud anyway. Nope. Like you, you, you can't even you can't even use the well, yeah, it was distasteful, but we were trying to draw money. It's like it wasn't even a money feud anyway. Yep. 2016. This this was like a time capsule to me because I watched this live and then had not thought about it probably since which was the the only MMA entrant on this website uh, or on on this list somehow. It's the Bellator Kimbo Slice versus Dada 5000 fight, which is like, you know, Kimbo is this legendary street fighter that was like an internet sensation. And so he got, he had like a late, late, late in life MMA career where he would fight tomato cans and and they got this guy who had like i guess was kind of had blown up on like world star hip hop and things like that for you know being a, a tough guy and a street fighter uh but he was not uh an athlete in any way and he was clearly not in in fighting shape and the fight is very brief and uh dada 5000 basically passes out <laughs> And uh, in the mi- middle of the fight and uh, nearly dies as a result. And then I think a few years later, both are dead. So, yeah, I mean, this was this this is like, again, where you get into the carny roots of this business of just throw it on TV because we think it's going to pop a rating or it's going to make us money. Like, like this, this is a broader thing about like, you know, athletic commissions and what they let go on if <laughs> if enough money is on the line for it. This was many years past Kimbo's actual peak or career as an MMA fighter. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dada's still alive, by the way. Okay, because, Dada is still alive. Because he's booked, I think. I think uh, somebody is trying to book him for a fight Sheesh. here in at the end of 2022, 2023. Um, I mean, okay, so... Kimbo got a TKO in that fight, and uh, then Kim. Then it was overturned to a no contest because Kimbo uh, tested positive <laughs> for a steroid and having an elevated testosterone level. Anyway, yeah, it was bad. It was it was bad. Um, yeah, it was a freak show fight. Pre, I mean, if we're gonna punish people for booking freak show fights, uh, I I I don't know. Uh, I think it's b- maybe because it happened on American soil. Because if this happened in Japan or Russia, like nobody bats an eye at this, where they have more regular. <laughs> this sort right. of thing happens more regularly. Yeah, it, I I put this on ringside doctors more than I put it on the promoters. The promoters are like, "All right, we got a freak show fight. Let's mm-hmm. do a freak show fight." So the guy, the Dada, he. They had to take him out of the ring on a out of the cage on a stretcher, and he was in cardiac arrest and he was dehydrated and had kidney failure. So yeah, I put that on ringside doctors and whatever commission, if any, sanctioned this fight. And let's see if I can figure out what the commission would be. Oh, it was Texas. All right, so that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to think it was like the spirit of Fritz came upon sure. the Texas Athletic Commission. And, well, uh, Texas is a place that UFC would always run to if they couldn't get w- somebody that had failed a drug test. If they couldn't get them licensed mm-hmm. in Las- in Nevada or California, they would they would just ha- have the show in Texas uh, because they would license anything. So, mm-hmm. I, yeah, I put this on Athletic Commissions and, um, and uh, ringside doctors for not stopping things. I don't, I don't necessarily think that's a disgusting promotional tactic you know it's like no i think you're right i disagree with this entry yes fair enough and uh boy 2017 i did not realize he's been dead for this long but uh snook jimmy snook had died uh good uh yeah good hope he hope he transfers to hell um and of course this was he had been tried after all of these years had been tried for the murder of Nancy Argentin. I've, I'm bad at pronouncing her last name, but his his girlfriend, who was Argentino, Argentina, Argentina. Argentina? Okay. I yeah. let's go with that. Um, 
It's Argentina. Yeah. Okay, Argentina. So I think I think in my head it's our it's Argento, and then I always see the I N O on the right. end, and I'm like that's the spelling, right. right? Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah. So so they he had been on trial for that. Uh, I don't remember what the the re- the trial was resolved. He did not go to jail. <laughs> um, and but that was a pretty fresh in the news cycle story. And yet, when Snuka died, there was a there was a two and a half minute tribute video that played, and you know they talked about what a what a hero he was to the to to the the WWE and the WWF. And this is an example, in maybe the most <laughs> ridiculous of ways, but how Vince had his guys, and he was going to protect their legacy because perhaps he viewed it as protecting their legacy also protected his legacy but yep snooka was going to get that tribute video even if he had died in jail (laughs) i think snooka was going to get this tribute video when uh, when he passed away yep one of its guys who's going to get it he was ruled uh or deemed uh mentally not fit to stand trial that's uh, right so so they charged him 32 years after Nancy Argentino died, he was charged with third degree murder and involuntary manslaughter. And so, uh, and then they said that um, his lawyers argued, he pleaded not guilty. His lawyers argued that he was not mentally fit to stand stand trial. Eventually, um, a judge agreed and the charges were dismissed. And then he died. He died like two weeks after the charges were dismissed. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, yeah. But yeah, you're right. That's exactly what it was. One of Vince's guys got the hero treatment. Even the song choice. We talked about this on the show at the time. Like Mm -hmm. the lyrics of the song that they used for the for the video package were really, really uh, 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 in, in poor taste. And uh yeah, I got, I have uh, I think this is a fine entry. Yeah, no, this was this was awful, and he was awful, <laughs> and it's good that he's dead. Um, <laughs> moving on to we got a, a two year in a row winner, uh, twenty eighteen and twenty nineteen is the WWE. Uh, it, it's it's ongoing relationship uh, with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Um, like it makes more sense. I mean, it was they they got paid money to do propaganda and they did it. Like that's it it's one of those things where it's it's hard for me to get like exceptionally mad at this because it's more a side effect of what a, the economic system is in this country, right? It's like everyone must be in every company must be searching for growth at all time. Well, a country wants to pay you a billion dollars over 10 years to to do uh, two shows a year for them. You yes. so you did it. And yes. you did it. You took the money and you ran. Uh going there mere days after uh Jamal Khashoggi was killed. Pretty rough. <laughs> pretty rough optics. That's like the worst of that. That was in 2019 obviously. But uh yeah i mean it's bad it's bad that they do it but it's also like i said i view that more as a a broad a broadly like a broad failing of the way success is measured for for business in in this country i guess i don't know like it's it's bad don't get me wrong but it seems tame to me compared to some of these other entries I agree with your sentiment. I wouldn't use the word tame, mm. but I, 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 we're just arguing semantics at that point. Um, a corporation doing a thing that a corporation does. It's like, well, you yeah, know, we shouldn't be surprised by that. Uh, but, uh, I mean, you can't argue that it's not disgusting. So there yeah, you yeah, no, no, no arguments there. And then uh, finally, another dual winner in 2020 and 2021, which was WWE firing, uh, you know, doing mass layoffs in the midst of record profits, which again, what did we just say? (laughs) 
it's you have to show growth even if you just had the if you just made the most money you've ever made in the history of your company if you only make that much again the next quarter that will be looked at as a failure so like this is again this is a side effect it's not i'm not saying it's good a lot of people lost their jobs we've talked about that on the show really ever since hunter took over and started bringing people back a lot of the people that were probably promised a job for life or were promised or felt they had security that had the rugs pulled out from under him. He's clearly tried to bring a lot of those people back, but it was, you know, it's, it's definitely scummy, but again, like the root cause here is not, under, it's not WWE being like, especially greedy. It's just, just your regular garden variety corporate greed. Yes. It's uh, just part of the, the rich tapestry and beautiful potpourri that is the, Wrestling Observer Newsletter's most disgusting promotional tactic award. That's right. And so that brings us to the end. Obviously, 2022's uh, vote has not been cast yet. Um, but with that in mind, I think there are three major candidates here. Really, two Ooh. majors and one extra. I think you throw Jose Gonzalez in there because he murdered a man. Um, maybe you could throw Snooker there <laughs> also then. <laughs> But he I don't murdered a woman. Yeah. That's true. Um, but it's it's Vince and Fr- it's Vince or Fritz, right? Like those are the two. Vince has for, because of the sheer quantity of times the WWF slash E has won this award, or Fritz because of the escalating heinousness of how he won the award every year. I guess. Like I think those are your two candidates. Yeah, I would. Uh, Vince has the longevity. Um, Vince is the Vince is the Hulk Hogan of this award, and maybe for maybe Fritz is the Bill Goldberg uh, or something. But I would uh, I I would cast my ballot for Fritz. Uh, I just think of all the scummy people in the history of wrestling, Fritz has a special place in my heart as maybe the scummiest. I think it's yeah, and I think it's because for all the bad things that Vince McMahon and the WWE have done it's like to to exploit the death of your own children maybe and again if vince had a had a child that died maybe he would have done the same thing we'll never know but it's i think it's that like the the deeply personal way in which fritz exploited his own family's tragedies to make a buck is like i i I think it's fritz (laughs) I think yeah. it's Fritz. Yeah, I, I definitely think this should be the Fritz Fine Eric Award. Yep. Well, well, that about settles it. I'm going to put a poll up. So follow us if if at TWL Podcast, if Twitter still exists by the time you're hearing this. Underscore then, podcast. Yeah. TWL underscore podcast. And uh, you can uh, you could follow us there and uh, and vote in the poll uh, and and let your let your voice be heard. Although I'm not sure we want to run another poll after the the ham medicine debacle of uh, of earlier this year um uh but uh but yeah we're i'll i'll put a poll up if if twitter still exists when uh, when this airs and uh and we y'all can definitely chime in on it uh the listener can can have their voice heard but yeah i think this was this was it's it's a weird way to look down memory lane because you're only looking at like the worst things that this <laughs> that this business has to offer in a lot of these years but it's uh it's again i think the 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 fun and the wackiness of going from bob backlin got pushed too hard to uh you know fritz put his brain damaged son on tv two months after he almost died like it's just that that whiplash it gives you is why i think i I keep coming back to this category every year as, as my most anticipated observer award yeah, it's it's the best. Yeah, got no got got no problems with uh, any of it. I'm just rambling now because <laughs> I, I'm I'm reading I'm reading about the death of Twitter as we record this. Mm-hmm. It's like wow, wow, this site might actually explode. Like the, the they might they might bring it back. I don't know. <laughs> they yeah. might find a way to keep they might find a way to keep it alive, but maybe not. I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and. Uh... It seems maybe too late to do this, but 
I'm probably going to go ahead. If you want to follow at TWL underscore podcast on Instagram, uh, I'm going to make that because I don't know how else to promote when we have a new show out. <laughs> yeah. um, so I'm going to make that and uh, and try to get that up and running and I'll post start posting there regularly. Whether Twitter dies or not, I'll start using that more regularly. So if you want to follow us there, that's great. But yeah, uh, <laughs> what a way to go out, you know? The world's yeah. richest and dumbest man blew it all up in like three weeks. All right. Well, thanks to everybody for joining us for the Thanksgiving Spectacular. What a year. We have so much to be thankful for. And until next time, I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. And we'll be back soon with more stories from the wrestling life. Merry Thanksgiving. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Now, here are this week's bonus features. You want to wrap up the show? Or? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm. Uh, I don't know what's going on here. No, I was like, sure. I kind of steered yeah. the middle portion, but then you opened yeah. the show, so I figured you would outro it as well. All right. Well, thanks to everybody for joining us for the Thanksgiving spectacular. There you go. It was fun. I like. <laughs> I like these. I read stuff, and <laughs> oh, they're the best. And you saw. Cause, I mean, it's real easy to <laughs> like. <laughs> like especially when I saw that Alan made that thread, I was like perfect plus he's giving like context to it so i don't have to look up why yeah. this one was particularly heinous like perfect yeah yeah good times man yeah so what what has arisen to fill the void that uh, the coke energy has left in your life well nothing will ever do that but um <laughs> Uh, this is a rock star boom. Um, the whipped strawberry flavor. It's the damnedest thing. It tastes exactly like a whipped strawberry. Oh, oh, one of those. <laughs> it's one of those falafel hot dogs. What do you mean, what do so, you mean one of those? <laughs> It's a coffee filter. It fills the <laughs> cigarette box. I got it out of the food basket over there. <laughs> That's a trash can. <laughs> so, Rockstar, I, I don't know. I w- would have thought that all of those energy drinks that are marketed to like 17 year olds mm-hmm. would be beneath me would be beneath me but these <laughs> rock star energy drinks um they have a whipped strawberry that's very good they have mm-hmm. a fruit punch that's very good okay i think i think in my head i've trained myself to where caffeine has to taste like coffee <laughs> so even if i do energy drinks they're like the the monster coffee ones the Java monster. Yes. I try not to do those too often, but usually if I'm working late on the Friday, I usually get one from, from the CBS and that's in, in the same parking lot as me. And uh, make that my <laughs> make that my treat for making it to like, you know, 2 30 p.m. <laughs> well now it's time for a reward. <laughs> Between 2 30 and 4 p.m. on Fridays that I work till 6 is treat day. <laughs> for 90 minutes, drink whatever you want. Uh, the, uh, our, our Christmas gift this year was a fruit basket uh, from, from the bank. Uh, or holiday gift, I guess, because uh, they sent it to us already. And it's it's a nice it's a nice basket. There's also like little chocolates and stuff in it, and those weird uh, salt uh, salt water crackers or whatever. 
What? You know, those like really thin wafery saltine crackers. I don't know what they're called. Salt water crackers? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Look, don't don't make this the story. This isn't part of the, me not knowing what those crackers are called. It's not the story. <laughs> okay. I'm not taking questions. All right. <laughs> but um uh, I always it's it's nice. It looks like they spent a lot of money on it. Like it's it's like you know, high end chocolates and a lot of fresh fruit and stuff. And my thought always comes back to uh just give me the money you spent on that. Just, yes, just give me the money. When every so often, seemingly like twice a year, they have me fill out a little form of you know, it's like, what, you know, what do you, what do you want to do with, with, you know, where do you see yourself in the bank in a couple of years? Where do you do this? What do you think you need to work on? And then at the bottom is always like, how do you like to be rewarded? And every year I put money <laughs> and <laughs> nothing else. Right. And, but you know, they, it's a nice fruit basket. <laughs> it's a nice fruit basket. Good enough. Good enough. There you go. What a time. I try to keep on keeping on.